Good afternoon, everybody. We don't have live streaming today, but we are recording, which meets all of our open session uh, requirements. And it will be uploaded to the YouTube channel. So I want to welcome everyone to the February 22nd Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting in chambers as well as online. Accessibility Advisory Committee meetings are being held in a hybrid meeting format at this time. The public can observe meetings of council and committees by attending in person in the council chambers or by viewing the live stream of the open session part of the meetings, which can be accessed on the city's website or on the city's YouTube page. Please note that we have received regrets from committee member Lawrence Raifman for this afternoon's meeting. The public had the opportunity to submit written correspondence regarding agenda items by email to the clerk's office. All written correspondence received by noon yesterday would have been included on the agenda, but none was received. The public also had the opportunity to apply to appear as either an in-person or electronic delegation by noon yesterday to be included on the agenda, but no delegation requests were received. As chair of the committee, I now call this meeting to order. Could I have an adopt the adoption of the agenda moved by someone on committee? Thank you very much. We have adoption moved by Simon Waldman. All those in favor, just raise your hands. Committee members, thank you. That's approved unanimously. Oh, I see, and Councillor Scott Thompson is with us. Welcome, Councillor Thompson. Thank you for joining us. Uh, any disclosures of pecuniary interest or the general nature thereof? Seeing none. First item up is 4.1, which is adoption of previous minutes. Minutes Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting AAC 0423, held November 2nd, 2023. Could I have a member of committee please move that? Uh, does, and then we can have a discussion if necessary. Shala, thank you. Uh, moved by Shala. Anybody on committee have any comments about the minutes? Trust you've all read them. Thank you very much. All those in favor, uh, raising your hands, please, committee members. That, that carries. Thank you. Okay. We have no delegations, and we're going to get to our scheduled uh, business. We have uh, two presentations today. I want to welcome both uh, to in council chambers. The first one 6.1 is the York Region Overview and the 2023 to 2027 Multi-Year Accessibility Plan. Presentation by Kim Bacani Angus and Valentina Nowalski from the Regional Municipality of York. This is a 30 minute presentation. Thank you very much for joining us. Come up to the podium and the mic is yours. Good afternoon, Councillor Silvitz, Councillor Davidson, Councillor Thompson, and valued AAC members. My name is Kim Bacani Angus, Lead for Accessibility and People, Equity and Culture at the Regional Municipality of York, also known as York Region. I have dark hair, dark eyes, and I go by the pronouns she and her, and today I'm wearing a black top and a black and white printed skirt. We like to start all of our introductions at our, our York Region Accessibility Advisory Committee meetings, with an inclusive introductions. And so we're just trying to show and set the tone for today's meeting. Together with Valentina Nowalski, we will be providing a brief overview of York Region and York Region's 2023 to 2027 multi-year accessibility plan to give you a better understanding of York Region's accessibility plan and our roadmap for the next several years. This title slide shows a background image of the York Regional Administrative Building at 17250 Young Street in Newmarket. Next slide, please. Our agenda for this presentation includes an overview of York Region, including information about our community and the core services that we offer. We will also share an overview of York Region's commitment to accessibility, the roles and responsibility of our accessibility unit within the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility Division at York Region. We'll go through York Region's 2023 to 2027 multi-year accessibility plan. 
and we'll end our presentation by sharing a few ways that members of the Richmond Hill Accessibility Advisory Committee can get involved in some of York Region's current and future projects. At the end, you will have an opportunity to ask any questions, but feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation as well. Next slide, please. Let's begin with a brief overview of York Region. Next slide. York Region was established in 1971 and is one of six regional governments in Ontario. This short video will help you to understand the two-tier regional government system in Ontario and the role York Region plays in creating strong, caring, safe communities for the people who choose to work and live in York Region. A descriptive transcript of the video is available and should have been shared with members along with the presentation. What is York Region? York Region is made up of nine towns and cities. They are Georgina, East Gwillimbury, Whitchurch Stouffville, Markham, Newmarket, Aurora, Richmond Hill, King, and Vaughan. York Region is a two-tier government system. What is a two-tier government system, you ask? Well, in order to answer this question, we need to look at the bigger picture. We live in Canada. Canada is run by the federal government. The federal government is led by the Prime Minister. The province we live in is Ontario. Ontario is run by the provincial government and is led by the Premier. Inside our province are many towns and cities, also referred to as municipalities. Municipalities are run by municipal government and are led by mayors. Each town and city within York Region has something called a council. Council is a group of people who are elected by the public and they make decisions about things that affect the community. Things like how money is going to be spent, what things are going to be built, what policies and bylaws are going to apply to people. Town and City Council, also referred to as Municipal Government, is responsible for what goes on inside the borders of the towns and cities they serve. Our nine towns and cities, when combined, make up York Region. York Region is run by regional government and is led by a chairperson. As mentioned earlier, each town and city council is led by a mayor. This means that York Region has nine mayors altogether. These mayors, along with regional councillors from select towns and cities, make up York Regional Council. York Regional Council meets to discuss issues and services that impact all of the towns and cities in York Region to make sure our communities are as strong, safe and caring as possible for the people who work here or call York Region home. To find out more about York Region and York Regional Council, go to york.ca. Thank you. We can move to the next slide. In terms of your, our York Region community, this slide shows a map of York Region with the 2022 population counts for each of the nine municipalities. As of December 2022, more than 1.2 million residents call York Region home, including people from all cultures, races, ethnicities, languages, religions, abilities, and ages. York Region is the third largest municipality in Ontario and continues to be one of the fastest growing and most diverse communities in Canada, with a population that includes close to 240 distinct ethnic groups. About 75% of our population live in the southern three municipalities, Markham, Vaughan, and Richmond Hill. According to the 2017 Canadian Survey on Disability, nearly one in five people, or 162,600 residents aged 15 years and older, have at least one disability. This represents 18% of our population. We're waiting for updated data and we will be happy to share it once it becomes available. Next slide, please. York Region's organization-wide vision, mission, and values unites staff together and is applied to everything that we do. At York Region, we envision strong, caring, safe communities through our mission of working together to serve our thriving communities today and tomorrow by relying on our values of integrity, commitment, accountability, respect, and excellence. Next slide. On this slide, there are 15 icons to represent the 15 York Region core services. 
The region is responsible for providing services to the public to help maintain a quality of life for York Region residents. The core services include children's services, community housing, court services, development all services, economic development, forestry, long-term care, paramedic services, police services, which are delivered by York Regional Police, public health, regional roads, social assistance, transit, and waste management. Next slide. This slide outlines the many programs and services that are offered to York Region residents and is presented in three columns. The slide is entitled Municipal Service Delivery Within York Region. In the first column, as regional government, we are responsible for large scale services that serve all residents, such as police services, transit and forestry, as previously mentioned. These are services that the region is legislatively required to provide, and many are partially to fully funded by the province, including services provided by housing, paramedics, long-term care, public health, social assistance, and child children's services. The middle column lists the services which are provided solely by our local municipalities like snow removal, recreation, and licensing. Finally, the right column lists some of our integrated services that are delivered jointly by the region and the local municipalities, which can sometimes be confusing for some residents, such as roads. However, main roads such as Young Street are the responsibility of the region, while other local roads are the responsibility of the municipality. Next slide. We'll do a quick overview in terms of accessibility and where we are situated within the, the region. Next slide. The accessibility unit is part of the larger inclusion, diversity and equity and accessibility division in the people, equity and culture branch in the office of the chief administrative officer. The accessibility unit is committed to making our programs, services and facilities more accessible to people with disabilities in compliance with the Ontario for Ontario Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, otherwise referred to and known as the AODA. Our unit leads corporate accessibility activities across all regional departments, including York Regional Police, in compliance with the AODA. We also develop and oversee and implement the York Region's multi-year accessibility plan, which we will be talking about shortly. The unit also acts as the secretariat for the York Region Accessibility Advisory Committee, and we work closely with subject matter experts across our corporation and our AODA leads for each of the AODA standards to implement the AODA requirements. The Inclusion, Diversity and Equity Unit within our, our branch aims to create communities that value, respect and embrace diversity so that everyone can achieve their full uh, potential as guided by the Inclusion Charter for York Region. We all use a research, best practice, and data-driven approach to inform all of our inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility work. I'm going to hand it over to Valentina to take us through the multi-year accessibility plan. Thank you, Kim. This is Valentina speaking. My pronouns are she and her. I am a middle-aged woman. I have blonde hair and green eyes. Today, I'm wearing a white shirt, a blue blazer, and dark navy pants. It is a pleasure to be here with you today, and thank you for this opportunity to present to your committee. I will be taking you through the next few slides, which will focus on York Region's 2023 to 2027 multi-year accessibility plan. As you are probably aware, municipalities across Ontario, including regional governments, must have accessibility plans and provide annual status reports on the progress of implementing these plans. Multi-year accessibility plans are required under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. They must be posted on organizations' websites. They must be reviewed and updated at least once every five years, and they must be developed in consultation with Accessibility Advisory Committee and people with disabilities. Annual status reports are also required under the AODA. They also must be posted on organizations' websites, and they provide an update on the progress of measures taken to implement the multi-year accessibility plans. So York Region's 2023 to 2027 plan, which you have received an electronic copy of, we also have some hard copies available here. If you'd like one, we would be happy to give it to you at the end of the meeting. 
Um, this plan outlines how York Region and York Regional Police meet the requirements of the AODA. We produce one plan for both organization, and it only applies to York Region and York Regional Police. It outlines how we remove barriers in our programs, services, and facilities for people with disabilities across five areas of daily living, including information and communications, employment, transportation, design of public spaces, and customer service. AODA also has general and compliance requirements. Through this plan, we strive to make your region more inclusive and accessible to everyone. Next slide, please. In 2023, your region developed its current 2023 to 2027 multi-year accessibility plan. The development of this plan included seven key steps and took several months to complete. Before we started to draft the plan, we carried out phase one consultations and consulted with the York Region Accessibility Advisory Committee, as well as internal subject matter experts on uh, the draft plan. We developed the draft plan and then posted this draft for public consultation and went back to the York Region Accessibility Advisory Committee as part of phase two consultations. Followed by council approval of the plan in November of last year, and posting and distribution of the plan. The plan was launched in early December to coincide with the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, uh, which was celebrated on December 3rd. Uh, today, we are in the implementation phase of the plan and annual status reports will be provided in 2024, 2025, and 2026. On this slide, there is an infographic outlining seven key steps I just mentioned for the development of this plan. And there is also a cover page of the plan. On the cover page, we have a photo of two York Region residents, including a member of our Accessibility Advisory Committee, enjoying one of Region's accessible trails. York Region has four accessible trails, and we invite you to explore these. This plan only includes images of York Region residents, York Region staff, and Accessibility Advisory Committee members, many of whom are people with disabilities. This was one of the suggestions that came from our York Region Accessibility Advisory Committee to include images of real people who are residents of York Region and who most of them have um, disabilities, not stock images that we are used to. So we are quite proud of this achievement. Next slide, please. Thank you. On this slide, there is a list of key elements of the plan, which includes a link acknowledgement, a message from York Regional Council, a message from the York Region Accessibility Advisory Committee, a summary of the plan, York Region at a glance section, a section about the development of the plan and summary of consultations, and the next section is called the plan in action. And that's where key actions that address general and compliance requirements under the AODA are listed, as well as requirements under all five standards. The latter part of the plan focuses on next steps and continuous quality improvement actions, actions to monitor, evaluate, and report on the AODA. And um, there's also feedback and contact information at the end of the plan. Next slide, please. Although not a requirement of the AODA, York Region and York Regional Police will continue to implement continuous quality improvement actions aimed at ensuring program services and facilities continue to be accessible to everyone. This includes reviewing processes created to meet the requirements of the AODA and identifying opportunities for improvement including reviewing and updating regions accessible procurement practices and procedures under general requirements, reviewing and updating regions information and communication guidelines, and enhancing access to training, resources, and supports for staff in their adoption of the application of the guidelines under information and communication standards. Um, we will also be undertaking an equity audit to review human resources policies from an inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility 
lens. And we will review your region's internal disability management program to align with the new Canadian Standards Association on workplace disability management. This is the first national standard on occupational disability management and your region hopes to adopt it in the next four years. Under transportation standard, our transit partners will conduct an accessibility and best practices review to enable YRT to make informed decisions around how to improve accessibility of its services, including Mobility Plus. Design of public spaces standards will also undergo a review and we will update the region's accessibility design guidelines for buildings and facilities to meet current best practices for newly constructed or redeveloped spaces to ensure the region continues to meet uh, the standards and to be a leader in developing accessible environments for all. Lastly, we will conduct an internal needs assessment to determine opportunities for continuous improvement in serving customers with disabilities under customer service standards. York Region and York Regional Police will continue to monitor the province of Ontario's legislative reviews of accessibility laws and its requirements. Both organizations will continue to comply with the AODA and its regulations, including any amendments to existing or the release of new applicable standards. As legislated, York Region and York Regional Police will review this plan at least once every five years. An annual status report outlining the progress on the actions taken will also be prepared, as I mentioned, in 2024, 25, and 26. These documents will be posted on the regions and York Regional Police websites, so on york.ca and yrp.ca, and will be made available in other accessible formats or with communication supports upon request. Accessibility compliance reports are submitted to the province every two years as required under the AODA, and um, as, which complies with Government of Ontario requirements. Next slide, please. So how can you contribute and how can you get involved? We welcome you to attend our York Region Accessibility Advisory Committee. As I mentioned, our meetings are open to the public and you are welcome to listen in on projects that interest you. YREC meetings are currently held virtually on Zoom from 4 to 6 p.m., typically on Wednesdays. We had our first meeting last evening and next meetings are scheduled for Wednesday, April 17th, Wednesday, June 26th, Wednesday, September 25th, and Wednesday, November 20th. Please check york.ca or email us at aoda at york.ca to make sure there are no changes to the schedule. You are all encouraged to participate in the upcoming Professional Development Forum, which will take place on Wednesday, May 29th, and this is a forum open to all Accessibility Advisory Committee members across nine municipalities. And indeed, a few members of this committee are on the organizing committee for that forum. So stay tuned for details. Um, the organizing committee have started to plan the event and we will share further details and time as soon as it's finalized. We definitely hope to see you there. You can also consider serving on the York Region Accessibility Advisory Committee. We do our recruitment every four years and the next recruitment will take place in 2026. Finally, we're always open to hearing from you. If you have any ideas on how to improve accessibility in the region and our program services and facilities, or have ideas on how we can work together, uh, or have any other questions, suggestions, or feedback, please email us at aoda at york.ca or participate in further public consultations. We typically carry public consultations for the development of our multi-year accessibility plans, as I mentioned earlier. Um, again, if there are any other opportunities throughout the years to participate in focus groups or surveys, we typically will share that information with this committee through um, the AAC committee coordinator. So please participate if you have uh, the capacity to do so. This concludes our presentation. We will be happy to take any questions you may have now or any feedback on the multi-year accessibility plan.
Thank you very much. Spasiba, Kim and Valentina, greatly appreciate it. That was an excellent presentation. I will certainly, um, uh, I will certainly be at the at the May May twenty ninth meeting. I look forward to it. Um, and I think if you could supply all members of committee who are in council this morning, this afternoon, with the hard copies, I would appreciate that. Thank you. And if anybody online. Uh, would like a copy as well, please let me know and we'll make sure you want one, Councillor Davidson. Okay, we'll make sure that we get ev everybody as well. Okay, thank you. So, uh, agenda item 6.1. Uh, could I have a member of committee bring this forward, please, so that we can have discussion? Councillor Davidson, thank you. Uh, Councillor Davidson, as you brought it forward, do you have any comments? Um, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the um, the presentation. I, I really like that you gave an explainer of the two tier government. I don't know that that's obvious to everybody. So thank you. That's an excellent element for all of us. Um, and I I guess um, I, I'm interested to know: Does the York Region Accessibility Committee recommend? to York Region staff, do they work with Richmond Hill staff to solve some of the issues we have in this this city particularly? How do the two different governments, Richmond Hill and York Region work together to solve some of the accessibility issues in Richmond Hill specifically? This is a great question and thank you for bringing it forward, Councillor Davidson. What we find is um, it really depends on the, the type or nature of issue that's being brought forward. Sometimes it really depends on the service that, that's being brought forward. Is it something that's of the local nature? Is it something that intersects? So an example that we often see is sometimes that confusion between major roads and some of our local roads, and it's trying to determine with city staff or local staff um, who would be able to kind of triage it from our end. So oftentimes when it comes to the accessibility and the compliance piece, it's really looking at in terms of who's responsible for that level of service. When it comes to the integrated services um, that we mentioned on one of our slides, it's usually a coordination of, of um, the key stakeholders between the two, two program areas or the local tiers and the regional tier. Thank you. And I know this is kind of a red hearing, but since you're here, um... I can't help but notice how many um, how many uh, special parking parking stickers everybody seems to have. And honestly, more often than not, I see someone perfectly able parking right up at the door, jumping in and driving away. Does the region have any, is anybody checking or ticketing people who might be borrowing someone else's parking pass? I mean, it's a real problem. And And my other question is who decides if a grocery store, for example, has two accessible spots or more, if, for example, it's on a regional road like Richmond Hill, uh, sorry, like Young Street. Okay. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, this is Valentina speaking. Uh, so in terms of uh, parking spaces, that would be a local municipal bylaw enforcement that would have uh, privy to oversee that. Um, I know that they do often work with York Regional Police and, and you know, maybe that's something that should be discussed further and worked on further. Um, but typically that would be a local um, matter. Uh, in regards to your second question, uh, it's Ontario Building Code as well as design of public spaces requirements under the AODA. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the caveats of the AODA is that it only applies to new buildings that, or significantly renovated buildings that have been uh, put in place after 2016. So that's right. where that uh, gap might come in. Um, typically, the regional, uh, and as far as I'm aware, the municipal governments wouldn't have um, uh, oversight over private businesses, that would be a provincial matter. And we encourage um, residents to um, to go to the province and to, um, to, to try to find answers at the provincial level as they may have a bit more oversight over businesses. Okay, thank you. I just want to say personally, I think this committee, I don't know, I haven't spoken to Karen about it, but even at a regional level, we need to start lobbying maybe through letters or whatever to change some of those standards with the province because as people age and we know more and more people, I mean, 18%, that's hot. I mean, that we have way more people who need some accommodation than we have 
than we obviously offer. So I hope, I don't know, Karen, I'll talk to you about this offline, but I hope this group can be a bit of a lobby group and we can write letters or do something to try to make a difference here. Um, Cause it's, 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 it's over time. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. And I just want to add that design of public spaces standards are currently being reviewed. So I think uh, once those final recommendations are posted uh, for public input, that would be a perfect opportunity for all committees to provide input. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davidson. We can certainly sit down and discuss that. And um, I'll get some input from our deputy clerk as to what the terms of reference are for uh, the actual um, activities of this specific committee. But thank you. Those were excellent questions. Uh, next on my list is the, um, Sherry. Go ahead, Sherry. You may unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that the numbers, um, the 18% number, I think everyone needs to be aware that that number is actually lower than what it actually is, because a lot of seniors, people have to self-report. And if you are an able bot, if you um, live most of your life as an able-bodied person, and all of a sudden you need some supports, or you maybe have a walker, those seniors aren't necessarily wanting to identify themselves on a survey as having a disability and needing um, accommodations. And also the fact that they've only starting at 15, um, there are children in this community that have disabilities as well. And, and as a population is aging. So I think a lot of the things this committee is advocating for are really, really critical. Um, and when you're creating um, standards and things and just, living up to the AODA, it's just not going to meet what the community needs. So I agree with Councillor Davidson that we need to um, help advocate for better change. And that was all, just the numbers are definitely higher than what you see. Thank you, Sherry. This is Kim speaking. And uh, we, we've definitely taken a look at the, the data. As you know, the 2017, um, data has needs to be updated and it has been released. Uh, we are doing a deeper dive within our areas with our data services folks. And so we'll take that into consideration. I think that that's great feedback that you're sharing and in, in terms of when we're looking at the age limits and, and also that self-disclosure and where the limitations are within the data. So I appreciate the comment. Thank you. Is that all Sherry? Yes. Thank you very much. Next on my list is Yue. Go ahead, Yue, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi, um, I, I have a question, but I'm not sure if AODA is really responsible. For example, I have a disability and, I'm, and I'm receiving o -O 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 ODSP and ODSP is going to cover my dental expenses. And uh, I can go like check my teeth every six months, and uh, but the problem is, it's very hard for me to find a dentist. You know, like I have been search for a dentist for a while, and uh, one of my parents' friend recommend me one of the dent one dentist and. She accepted me, but now she is getting old, and sometimes if I forget to call them, they do not uh contact me. So and I don't know what happened in the future if I they are retired, then no, let nobody is going to uh accept me as a patient. You know, yeah. Thank you, Yue. Thank you. Can can the region assist with something like that? When it comes to dental services, so York Region Public Health offers uh, a number of dental services. However, it's there's different kind of criteria. My best suggestion that I can offer is to contact Access York at Access York at York.ca. Um, they do have um, customer service agents that could kind of help in terms of what what can be offered from the region or at least be able to connect you to services out in the community. So I just call the access you. Correct. 
Okay. Access York, you can email or you can um, you can call and uh, the information is available on the website on york.ca. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Is that all you way? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Very interesting question. Next person on my speakers list is Shala. Thank you very much, Councillor Karen. Thank you very much. It was amazing um, presentation. It was really helpful. I have two questions, um, Councillor Karen. Can I just start with one and then wait for the second one after? So my question is that there are so many of the you know challenges that we have now. For example, when I go to Will, uh, Lake Wilcox and I see that the washroom is only two, male and female, and there is no gender washroom, so if somebody like my husband needs help, then I can have to go with him. I cannot go to help him because it's a male washroom. So I was wondering, and then I reach out to see what we can do. We have to wait for the next plan. Now, it's a good time to ask if there is any plan, like through the process of the plan, do you engage any of the people who have you know, challenges with accessibility? They already, that is their life experience, can be involved to come before the project is final that they can see if some of the things is really useful or not, or if they can add to that beside the committee, because some of the people, they like, you know, they go to the different places and they have different experience, but they cannot do anything now. They have to wait until the next phase of the plan. Thank you for the question, Shala. It's uh, Kim speaking once again. Um, I think that that's a great, great suggestion that you're offering. When it comes to local parks, that is that falls within the the city of Richmond Hill in terms of working with their parks and recs. How we deliver it with when it comes to our programs and services, as you know, the York Region Accessibility will Advisory Committee will provide feedback on our our regional buildings, our regional facilities itself. An example of our inclusive bathrooms, where we've done consultations in the past have included both York Region Accessibility Advisory Committees as well as staff when it came to our most recent building with 17150 Young Street, which does include an inclusive um, bathroom, gender neutral bathroom. What's great about our committee is when, when there are projects that come forward for consultation, that the, the feedback from the committee can be applied to other projects. So if there's another building being built down the road by another project area, another project team, the feedback that was provided on the importance of inclusive bathrooms or the, inclu uh, the design of that public space will be applied to ongoing projects. So we do have like that record and that maintenance kind of keeping to ensure that access accessibility is top of mind when it comes to new builds and new projects. Thank you very much. Anything further, Shala? That's about this. Uh, and the second question, I think that I have to wait for the second. Question. No, you can do your second question now. You still have three minutes and 38 seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, so my next question is about the parking. I want to know how much, I am not sure if that's something that is included in this plan or not. I know everybody has like you know, the people who are using the parking pass, they have different uh, kind of accessibility. They, they have different part, but some of the, like sometimes I find out through my own life or that I see other people, the people who, are, who have a car and they have to come out of the car, some of the parking lot in some of the plaza or something, it's really too narrow. They, they, if you know, they are not able to use those parking to come out of the car because the car is, the door needs to open, the wheelchair needs to come out and the person who wants to be independent, they have to be able to use the, you know, that, that is space that the wheelchair can come out. And that's why I don't know if this is something related to the, you know, space of the parking that how wide it is or not. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Shala. So um, design of public spaces standards do have minimum requirements for parking spaces. And typically organizations and new builds will, will want to meet that at the very least. Um, in terms of parking permits, that would be a provincial responsibility. They issue them and they sort of outline who gets them and what the criteria is that goes through the province. 
Um, but in terms of parking spaces and the widths, there are different, there's van accessible spaces and then there are regular accessible spaces and those may have different requirements. So for the van one, there are hashtags that are a bit wider and that typically will have space to the right or to the left of the car with a curb cut. But um, again, uh, buildings or spaces built prior to 2016 wouldn't fall under that. Um, we always encourage even our own accessibility advisory committee to go to the business and, and tell them about it because as we all know, um, you, you know, people with disabilities may have different needs and businesses sometimes may not be aware. Um, so if, but if it's a municipal or regional property, we would for sure um, be happy to, to talk to you about any regional properties if you've experienced that in our parking spaces. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. But the challenge is that it said van, but there is no limitation. The people can park in a van area with the, I, I know that's not something that we can control everyone, but there is, it said van, but it doesn't say that it is, for example, for only van or not. That's the challenge. That's why the person who is, who has that challenge, when they go, for example, to grocery shopping, they're not able to do it. They have to come back home because there is, there is no space available. That's why I'm asking. There is the car, it's not van, but it's parking in a small, like the bigger space. And not all the plaza have the van space. So many of them, they have parking, but not everywhere, like even the big models, so like the, not all of them, they have that. That's why I am asking for future. If there is something that it can be just, you know, discussed for at least future plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Shala. Uh, yeah, very relevant. Uh, I think we've had a slight discussion about it in, in previous meetings. What I will do is I will uh, send an email to Don Guy, who is our Director of Community Standards and Bylaw, and I will copy you and we'll get him to speak to you directly because I completely agree with you. There is, I, I know, if, if only the narrow ones are available, you cannot maneuver. Thank you, Shala. Thank you very much. Okay, um, is there anybody else? Who would like to speak on the first round? Ted, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for that feedback, Dad. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. I noticed that as well, and I agree. It's a very, very good thing to do, and I, I'd never really thought of it before until you actually did it. So I'm going to do that in future. So thank you very much for that. It's a it's an excellent thing. Okay. So um, second round. Is there anybody on the second round who would like to add anything? Ask anything? Just looking at the bench. Anybody online? Seeing none. Okay. So we have a um, 6.1a uh, that the presentation by Kim Bakani Angus and Valentina Nawalski from the Regional Municipality of York regarding York Region Overview and the 2023 to 2027 Multi-Year Accessibility Plan be received with thanks. And that has been moved by Councillor Davidson. All those in favor, raise your hands. Any opposed? Seeing none that carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciated. Next item on our agenda is 6.2. And we have a presentation by our, some of our staff members. Inclusion services in the city of Richmond Hill. Presentation by Jennifer Anderson, Recreation and Inclusion Program Coordinator, and Caitlin Endicott, Recreation and Inclusion Services Assistant. Please note this is a 20 minute presentation. Welcome ladies, I'm very glad to, to have you join us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you very much for having us here this afternoon to present to you on the inclusion services section within the Recreation and Culture Division. My name is Jennifer Anderson and I am the Recreation and um, Inclusion Program Coordinator. And my name is Caitlin Endicott, and I am the Recreation and Inclusion Services Assistant. 
So for the next few minutes, we're going to walk you through some of the successes of our inclusion services section over the last year of 2023, discuss with you some of the exciting things that we did, um, participants who attended our programs, and what we're looking forward to in the future. Next slide, please. So within inclusion services uh, and for our recreation and culture programs, there are several different types of support that we are able to provide to participants. Uh, so we do provide city one-to-one -one inclusion support staff. We also allow participants to provide their own external support person. So someone like a family member or a therapist or social worker that they already work with on a regular basis. And we also have volunteers who are called leisure buddies who can help to support participants in our programs as well. And then we also offer adapted programs, which are specifically designed for participants with disabilities. Next slide, please. Here we just have some photos. Uh, on the left, we have a photo of our inclusion camp team from summer camp 2023. And on the right, we have a photo of one of our participants in a wheelchair attending one of our archery programs. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So this slide is gonna walk you through um, the numbers of participants who attended recreation programs last year. The first bullet point that you'll see on there is that the total number of recreation registrations for individuals with disabilities last year was 874. I'll let you know that that number of 874 is people who have identified to the inclusion service section that they do have a disability. We are very aware that there's many participants attending all of our recreation programs who do have disabilities but may not have necessarily come through the inclusion services section um, to identify with us or get support through us. The next item on there is our school holiday programs. This is probably one of our most um, widely attended and popular programs that individuals of dis with disabilities attend. And these are our summer camp programs, our winter break programs, March break and PA day programs. Last year, we had 64 registrations in our camp adaptability program. This is a camp specifically designed for teens and young adults with disabilities. And we'll speak a little bit more about that program in a future slide. We also had 324 registrations in our inclusive and mainstream camp programs. The next section is our swimming programs or our aquatic programs. We offer many different types of swim lessons and aquatic programs that individuals uh, can attend. The first one is our adapted aquatics program. This is a program that is specifically designed for children, teens and adults with disabilities. And we had 89 registrations last year. In addition, we also have group swimming lessons where people are integrated into an, a swim lesson program and had 79 registrations. We also have individuals who attend private or semi-private lessons. And last year there was 20 registrations. And then we also offer leadership courses within our aquatic section. And these are courses where people are taking um, studies on how to become a lifeguard or other um, courses such as emergency first aid or standard first aid and CPR. And last year we had four registrations within that program. Within recreation and culture, we offer a wide variety of programs for all ages of participants, everything from sports to arts and crafts and some of our cultural programs at the David Dunlop Observatory. So within those programs, we offer both adapted and inclusive options. Last year, we had 74 registrations in our adapted programs and we had 153 registrations in our inclusive or mainstream programs. Next, we have our skating programs, very similar to swimming in terms of the different types of lessons that are offered for participants. Last year in our group skating lessons, we had 39 registrations. For this particular activity, many of our participants do prefer a private lesson. And so last year we had 25 registrations. And we also had three registrations in our family lessons where an adult is able to attend with a child together. We also worked with our skating team last year to test out a sensory skate event. So we ran essentially a public skate where we had no music playing um, and we had a lower level of lighting uh, just to make it a little bit more sensory friendly for some of our participants. And we also had an opportunity to try out some of our sledge hockey equipment for people who attended. 
And it was such a success that our skating team is actually now running these sensory friendly skates on a regular basis. So our overall numbers of 874 is a huge growth from the previous year, and we are looking forward to future uh, years as well. Next slide, please. So uh, City of Richmond Hill is a part of a committee called the Region of York Recreationists. This committee is comprised of the nine lower tier municipalities who meet typically about once a month and discuss inclusion across the region. This committee works every year to host an annual summer camp training for inclusion camp staff. And in 2023, the city of Richmond Hill actually hosted this event at the Langstaff Community Center. This training is very vital for our inclusion camp staff as it allows us to bring in subject matter experts as a region that train our staff that we may not necessarily have been able to have done as an individualized municipality. Next slide, please. As we mentioned earlier in the presentation, we do offer an adapted camp program called Camp Adaptability. So it is designed specifically for teens and young adults with disabilities. It helps to kind of bridge the gap. A lot of these participants were perhaps not able to attend summer camp when they were younger, or there's still a need for them to attend a program now, and they're typically over the age for most of our general camp programs. Um, so it is very well received by the community. We have a lot of participants who return year after year. And it provides them with an opportunity that is tailored to their needs and abilities. Last year, we were able to offer weekly special guests and swimming. And we actually had Richmond Hill Fire and Emergency Services attend twice. They were a huge hit. Um, they educated our camp participants about fire safety. And they also got to do some fun activities with them. And last year was the first summer that we were able to offer this program for all eight weeks, which was very exciting. Next slide, please. And so here we have some photos um, from those visits from fire and emergency services to camp adaptability. Um, the campers were particularly excited on the day that the fire truck came. They had an opportunity to interact with the firefighters. And I think for a lot of them, it was an opportunity to know what to do in the future if they ever need the assistance of uh, a firefighter. So that was a great opportunity for them. Next slide, please. So last year uh, on Sept Saturday, September 23rd, the city of Richmond Hill partnered with the Children's Treatment Network to host the Inclusive Information Fair at Langstaff Community Center. This was a huge event for the community with 151 individuals attending this event at, and 50, uh, sorry, 48 exhibitors who was able to provide information to families and individuals on special programs, services, and equipment. The Children's Treatment Network was also able to bring their equipment loan library out where a number of individuals actually had the opportunity to try and test out equipment that they had not been able to before. Next slide, please. These two pictures are just a quick snapshot of the information fair. Uh, the one on the left is a large picture showing all the different exhibitors that was at the event. And then the one on the right is a picture actually of Caitlin at the Richmond Hill booth. Next slide, please. Last year, we were very excited to be able to bring back one of our favorite events of the year for the first time uh, since COVID had hit. And that is our Inclusive Santa Photos event. So on Saturday, December 2nd at Richvale Community Center, we were able to hold this event where participants who are perhaps not able to go to a mall or other sort of loud, um, crowded setting to visit Santa and have some photos taken, were able to come and do that in a sensory-friendly environment at our community center. So they each got a little visit with Santa as well as some photos which we sent along to their families after the event. We had 14 individuals and their families attend, and they all expressed how much they enjoy this event and are very appreciative of it um, and are looking forward to it again in 2024. Next slide, please. And here we just have some photos from the event of a few of our participants and their families with Santa. Next slide, please. So the future of inclusion services, we are going to continue to develop, deliver, and promote inclusive and adapted programs across Richmond Hill to offer more opportunities for residents with disabilities. 
We're also going to continue to recruit and train inclusion staff to support participants with disabilities in our recreation programs. So that brings us to the end of this presentation. And I would like to thank each and every one of you for allowing us the opportunity this afternoon to present to you. Thank you very, very much, Jennifer and Caitlin. Greatly appreciate it. What, a, what an informative presentation. There were some things there that even I didn't know. That was wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so could I have a member of committee to please bring this to the floor so that we can, uh, we can begin a discussion? Shala, thank you very much. As the mover, Shala, would you like to ask any questions? Yeah, is it okay? Absolutely. Thank you very much. It was really good informative uh, information. Um, well, what is the range of the group that you're, because I see most of the picture, all of the pictures was about the, you know, young generations. And then I was wondering that if the adult is in under your department or not. Yeah. So through you, Madam Chair, yes, uh, we do support uh, individuals all the way from children, preschool, all the way up to adults and older adults. This was the first year actually that we have supported a fair number of individuals in the adult or older adult section uh, by providing one-to-one -one support in some of our drop-in programs. So, um... Is it okay? To, yeah. The, regarding the adults, uh, the, during the winter, it's a really, really hard time with the people with disability, children, including adults. And then because there are no lots, lots of spaces that they can go. And I reach out to the Oak Ridge's community center to see that what are the program, but I did through the flyer and all the information. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anything that, you know, it's uh, for, the people with disability that they can be together and then do something like chess, something that they can just do it together because that they can during the summer, winter, especially because it's a very depressed time so they can share their, their experience with each other. Yeah. So through you, Madam Chair, uh, we currently do not have programs specifically designed for adults with disabilities. Um, that is more of a segregated type program. It's always something that we're looking into. And as we require uh, receive requests, we do look into it further. However, at this time, what we are providing is support in a one-to-one -one format for drop-in programs or registered programs for adults with disabilities. So I can probably make sure that somebody through the clerk's department can share our contact information so that you have that and can um, provide requests to us if you have somebody who would like to attend with a support staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Shala. Our next person on the speaker's list is Councillor Davidson. There we are. Hello. Um, thank you. Uh, for your presentation. Um, I have a couple of pretty specific questions. One is um, for your campers there, and uh, I had the opportunity to be something, do something this summer, it's called Project Blaze, and it's where the um, firefighters invite girls in particular of high school age to come and um, see what it's like and do things. I, I just wanted to give a shout out for that because that was a great it was a fun thing. I got to, you know, hold the hose and everything. And there are many different jobs at the emergency services. And, and I hope um, it let me know if I need to extend an, an offer or get the firefighters to extend an offer to some of your campers if they're of that age. I think it would be really fun for them to come out. Um, the other thing I wanted to know is, um, are you... Are you at the table when, for example, today we got an email about festivals, the festival plan is coming, like what kind of festivals? Are you, or is there anyone at the table or is it incumbent on us as counselors and I'm learning my role to sort of say, hey, let's make sure there's something that's definitely accessible at one of these festivals or let's make sure we consider this. Um, our neighbors who don't, who might have accessibility challenges or disabilities. Is there input on city plans? And, and that goes for fitness, as Shala is saying, and all the other stuff that the city offers. Is there anyone at the table on staff specifically to advocate for people with disabilities? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, at this time, I don't sit on an, any event committee or festivals committee. However, there is always an opportunity to reach out to the inclusion team. I can look into it further and get back to you through the clerk's department. Well, thank you. If 
if it's on, you know, if it's incumbent on me, I, I have a seat at that table and I'm happy to do it and happy to, I've, I mean, this being part of this committee is teaching me so much of what I can do more than I already am. But I just wanted to make, sh I just wanted to know if, if in general, if someone's at the table already in terms of staff. Um, and the last question I have is um, uh, regarding like, there's a canoe club here and there's a canoe opportunity on Lake Wilcox. Is if if there's a, a if the city is um, for example let's use let's not use the canoe club let's say baseball let's say the baseball association for Richmond Hill is opening up and taking registrants who could who could ask them to you know to make it inclusive or who is that something that I would do as a counselor and this goes for Shala's question about you know the over fifty five club who would sort of advocate so that our folks in our community who are, are uh, disabled, if that's the right word to use, are thought of and maybe planned for. I guess I'm trying to figure out ways to advocate rather than create whole new programs, but also advocate for people for things we already have. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. So that is a great count, uh, question, Councillor Davidson. I actually don't have the answer for that and I can get back to you uh, through the clerk's department on an answer for that. We partner with many local organizations here within Richmond Hill to offer programs. Some of the examples that you provided, we don't currently have partnerships with. Um, okay. And I'm not exactly sure on the role within our section on advocating for that or who would be the advocate for that. But I can certainly look into it and get back through the clerk's department. Okay, great. I, I just don't want to step on toes, but there seems to be so few limits on what we can ask for as counselors. We, you know, obviously, we don't, none of it's binding, we don't demand. But I would be happy to work with you and then work, if you can't, in finding ways to make our community more inclusive. So thank you. Those are my only questions. Thank you, Councillor Davidson. Great questions. Um, okay, next on my speakers list is Sherry Caldwell. Go ahead, Sherry. And meet yourself. There you go. I'm I'm sorry I'm not there. I have a bad cold this week. So, but I would have liked to have met you in person. Um I am a caregiver and I have a daughter, Ashley. Um, she's um, in grade 13 at Richmond Hill High. So um, a big concern that I see for her and many others like her in the community is she's going to graduate high school soon. And there really is um, not a lot of programs for her after she finishes school. And um I do a, also a, lot, a bit of consultation with the city of Toronto in some of the advocacy I work I do. And in the city of Toronto, they actually have a lot of um, city run programs, day programs and such for their residents. And I'm wondering that is anything that the region or the city of Richmond Hill could consider doing. Um, there is a real need. So there's a few, I'm looking into where my daughter can go and there's a two or three year wait list or more. So that's a long time for these kids to sit at home doing nothing. Um, and I'm just wondering what kind of, what the city could do about this or if that's even something they would even consider. So young adults. So through you, Madam Chair, uh, yes, I am aware of the program that is offered in the City of Toronto, along with a few other places as well. It is definitely something that we can look into. And as we develop our programs and services, we always look at different age categories and needs within the community. And we always encourage family members, individuals, uh, and their guardians to reach out to us and let us know what the programs they are in need of. Thank you, Sherry. Any anything further? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd like to discuss that further with you, maybe, maybe offline, or we could have another meeting. Um, also, um, another program that actually I participated in that the City of Toronto ran, which was great. I mean, they have a lot of resources there, but they had a special um, market for people with disabilities, and this was um, all ages to um, 
for that had businesses and made um, homemade products. And it was actually quite a fun event that the city of Toronto won. And I wonder, I noticed that Richmond Hill runs a lot of Christmas markets and different markets, but they all have kind of barriers in that there's fees and things. And most people that participated at these markets were either not-for-profit or were individuals on very low income. And it was such a warm and welcoming event. I'm wondering if that would be something that the city of Richmond Hill or your your group would consider. And it was, I think it was the recreation department at the city of Toronto that ran it. Deputy Clerk Ban, and I apologize. You also wanted to add something when Councillor Davidson was speaking previously. Please go ahead. Thank you. Through the chair, uh, in regards to Councillor Davidson and the new member, committee member Codwell's uh, discussion about uh, city of Richmond Hill events, there, I actually sit on the but the seat team is a special events uh, advisory uh, team, and I will work with them to see if we can bring something forward to AEC in regards to accessibility. Uh, generally speaking, the seat team is uh, to work with organizers and festivals to make sure that it runs smoothly. I'm not aware of um, anything specific to accessibility, but I think that's something that we probably need to to add certainly on the agenda, and and, and we'll bring that forward. But I will talk to um, the seat team and we can bring something forward to AAC. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sherry, uh, is there anything further in the first round? We will definitely make sure that um, that Jennifer gets in touch with you offline and you can have a, a much, much more fulsome discussion. Is that okay? okay? Yep, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, anybody else on the first round? No, okay, so I've just got a few comments and then we'll go to a second round. Um, thank you, a wonderful presentation. Um, I particularly love the idea of leisure buddies. It's such a, such a great concept. And um, I think it would be wonderful for both partners, not just the one receiving it. So that's a terrific idea, thank you. And, um, I just see I've written something about inclusion services. Oh, yes, inclusion services. Um, when, because I'm I'm not sure of this, when a resident goes onto our website and they want to book something or look at something, is there something specific on our website that leads them to if you are if you are disabled or if you have a disabled child or young adult, please click here, something like that? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, so yes, there are several different pages on our website um, that will link to our inclusion services page. Uh, so Summer Camp is a great example. We have a section on there about camp participants with disabilities with some information that links over to our uh, inclusion services page, which has more information about the different types of support that we offer. Uh, so from a recreation program standpoint, we do have that on several different pages um, throughout the website. I believe on other pages of the website, there may be reference to contacting the clerk's department um, for accessibility needs uh, or that type of thing. Thank you. Um, could I ask that um, you, for all members of council, if you could send us like a slide, inclusionary slide, and then some details about how, um, how residents can look into this I think we'll reach a few people through our social media and websites um, that'll give them a bit more information that they may they may be looking for. So if if I could ask you to do that, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, sensory skate, also fantastic idea. My eldest son, he's now 40, but um, he is uh, high-functioning Asperger's. And uh, something like that would have been fantastic for him to attend because he can't stand loud noises and a lot of activity. So um, that would have been amazing. So thank you for including that and for including the, the, our firefighters there. That's always such fun, no matter where they are, they're always fun. Um, when you have, a, if or when you have another inclusion, inclusive information fair, would you please make sure that you let us know, this committee know about it? I would love to have attended the one last year. So if you could let us know just through uh, through the clerk's office um, that that the fair is coming up and then we can make sure that this committee and also members of council 
can be there if, if they so wish, because I think it would be very, very good thing for us to be there. Thank you. Okay. Those, oh, and Santa. Um, okay. Those are all my comments. A second round, I'm going to Shala. Thank you, the mother of you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a term good consideration. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I have two um, uh, important things about the swimming. If there is any swim person with disability registered for any swimming program, I really appreciate it if you guys consider the staff that they can be provide or volunteer, whoever is possible through your uh, responsibility that they can be helpful for some of the people. They are, they are not able to do that if they need change or they need to help to go through their, you know, through their wheelchair or something, they really need assistance. That's one of the things. And the other one for the summer events. Summer events, summer is in the corner and I can, like last year I attended quite a few events, but unfortunately there are, because the people are coming and they go and stay like in front of the, you know, uh, the first row of the event. And then when the people with disability come with wheelchair, uh, they are not able to go in front and there is no space provided for them specifically. It's most of the time they have to come and they, they don't feel comfortable to go and ask the people to pass or, you know, go stand. I think that it would be, maybe it's possible to just uh, put the first row for them or somebody, staff or volunteers, help them to go through the events. Because I find out so many times the people with disability they have disability, they, they avoid to attend because they know it's crowded and they cannot uh, attend the uh, summer program. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Any comments from your end? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, we can share some information with our events team uh, on that feedback for sure. That's excellent. Thank you. Anything further, Shara? No, we're good. Okay. Thanks, Anybody else on the second round? Just checking the bench here. Anybody online? I see Councillor Thompson is still with us. Councillor Thompson, do you have anything you would like to add to this conversation, sir? Um, no, but it, but this has been a very good dialogue, and I really appreciate that I was able to uh, have free time to, to come and attend today. So uh, thank you very much to the presenters and for everybody for all their comments. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. And I see Barry Monroe has also joined us. Thank you for coming, Barry. Wonderful to see you. Another committee member. Okay, so they're just checking one more time. We have no more to speak. So um, I want to, again, thank you very much. We have on the floor, uh, which was moved by Shala uh, Yagubian, 6.2, that the presentation by Jennifer Anderson, Recreation and Inclusion Program Coordinator, and Caitlin Endicott, Recreation and Inclusion Services Assistant, regarding inclusion services in the city of Richmond Hill, be received with thanks. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That carries, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, that brings us to the end of our agenda. Uh, agenda item seven is for adjournment. Do I have a member of committee who would like to move that? Thank you, Simon. Moved by Simon. All those in favor for adjournment? And that carries. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all. We are adjourned again. My thanks to the presenters. And my thanks to staff and to all everybody who attended online and in council chambers. See you at the next meeting. Bye-bye.